Hello, welcome to the Undisciplined Podcast reading series. There's an introductory video explaining everything that this series is about, why we're doing it, which books we're going to read, how it's structured. So now this is the first substantive episode, first release of Hans Kelsen's A Pure Theory of Law, Chapter 1. We're going to do a video for each chapter. This is the first one. The chapter is called Law and Nature. So what the idea is, is that I'll discuss slowly what is going on in this chapter, my reading of it, which I think is perhaps a little bit different in emphasis from the standard reading that you probably got in your undergraduate philosophy of law course. But yes, why a pure theory of law? This is really the book that stands as the kind of monument, in my opinion, of the positivist movement in legal theory. It's a work that if we talk about modern or 20th century legal philosophy, I think we cannot get around this one. We have to go through it. It's also in our series, chronologically, the first one. And I think that's why we do it first is so that it we can see how it influenced the books that came subsequently. The book A Pure Theory of Law, the first edition, came out in German in 1934. But in 1960, Carlson released a much more expanded, much revised, much more thorough version, which was released seven years later, 1967, in English translation by Max Knight. And this is the version that we're reading here. So this chapter, Carlson lays down a lot of the groundwork, a lot of definitional work being done, a lot of distinctions being drawn, and some of them kept, some of them discarded. Kind of the things you would expect the first chapter to have going forward into the rest of the book. He gives his justification for his choices, his methodological choices that he makes. So, the title of the book already gives away a big part of Carlson's idea, namely a pure theory of law. What does a pure theory imply? What is purity in this sense? So, Carlson has a problem with the prior study of legal theory in that he says law is often studied through the lens of other disciplines at least when we're doing theory building. He names politics, sociology, economy, and he says that's all good and well, and these fields have something useful to say, and that there are insights to be gained from it, but a pure legal theory cannot get mixed up with the methodologies of other, other disciplines. So, in order to avoid methodological confusion, a pure theory of law should use legal methods, legal reasoning, not reasoning from other disciplines in order to arrive at its conclusions. This is also why he says in the very first sentence, he says this is a positive theory of law. So a positive theory of law means that it uses legal methods and the object of the study, what this methodology is applied to, is law. Law is our object. So what does that mean? Carlson says that what we're studying in the broadest sense are acts. And he distinguishes immediately between two different kinds of acts. He says acts that can be perceived by the senses, the normal, he calls these subjective acts. These are always human acts, by the way, not the non-human or the natural world. Law is strictly a human or social endeavor. So we have acts, subjective, perceivable by the senses. And then on the other hand, we have objective legal acts. 
these two can overlap, of course, but where subjective acts are from the position, from the observing position of perhaps a single person, objective legal acts are acts that are observed from the point of view of the legal system and legal meaning is projected and received onto those acts. So this is what he places as the fundamental object of a pure theory of law. Which begs the question, how do we know the difference between a subjective act and an objective legal act? He says that we arrive at this answer through interpretation. Fair enough, but what do we interpret through? We need a lens when we're observing and interpreting. Carlson's answer to that is that we interpret acts through norms. And norms, this is the key word for him. Now again, this begs another question. What is a norm? A norm is an act or behavior which is commanded, permitted, or authorized. And he quickly admits that society is full of commands, not just legal or normative commands. We're always commanding in every day. So he juxtaposes a legal command or a legal norm with the command of a gangster. I like to picture a highwayman who stops you on the highway and says your money or your life, which is a form of command, right? An everyday kind of command. Why is that not a legal act? Why does that contravene the law? And it's not a legal command. He, he puts this in opposition to the income tax collector who also comes to you and says your money or, or something else, imprisonment or whatever. What distinguishes these two? Carlson says that the gangster does not have a norm behind him. The government tax collector has a norm behind him. So it's the norm that distinguishes these commands. So norms often command, but not all commands are norms. So how do norms come about? One of the ways which Carlson provides us is a very traditional account of norms, and that is namely through custom. So we know what custom is, so two persons or two groups or communities act towards each other in a certain way. And through their action and through their mental exercise, a norm is created, an expectation and a norm is created. Even after the original people involved in this process have passed away, we see the norms still existing. So norms that emerge this way have an independent life or existence outside of the individuals that make them. You know, we could say it's not pure contract, but something bigger than that, something more permanent, these kind of norms. But how do we recognize a norm? What? That's how it comes about, but how do we measure the normness or normworthiness of something. So Carlson gives quite a few requirements of what a norm should have. He calls this the effectivity of norms as one sense of that. And how do we know that a norm is effective? He gives at least two reasons. He says, firstly, norms are applied by legal organs and that it is also generally obeyed by subject to that legal system. Laws can be personally valid, they can be materially valid, materially being not applicable to persons, but applicable within a sphere of human activity, such as politics, economy, etc. Norms can also be valid in a limited sense or unlimited sense, uh, you know, for all time and for everyone or in a limited time for a limited amount of people or even the old, 
or even just one person. So quickly, the idea of values come up in the chapter. So in applying norms, you know, a decision has to be made. Kelson talks here about values, and he says the only value that we can use if we want to approach law and norms in a scientific or positivistic or pure way is the negative and positive value attached to non-compliance and compliance of a norm. So those are the only values that a real scientific lawyer should concern himself with. Has a norm been followed? That's a plus. Has a norm not been followed? That's a negative. These are the only values that we're capable of judging norms and laws. So in this sense, the values of the legal system are not inherent, but they're completely arbitrary and they are projected from outside of the legal system, right? So we cannot say, legally speaking, whether a certain law is uh, of high or low value. This has to come from outside the law. All the legal system can say is the law has been complied with or it's not been complied with. This is the only positive and negative values known from within the legal system. This also has important implications for legal judgment. Let's say the judge in a court, right? He's not projecting his own values, hopefully. We know that's a problematic statement, but ideally speaking or scientifically speaking, if you like. What does a judge do? He only, at the end of the day, even after hearing arguments and saying that there are different interpretations of the law, he only has to decide, has a norm been complied with? or not and if it's been complied with it's fine not then there's sanction that follows punishment that follows so this is important because it means that this decision this value free value of the legal system compliance non-compliance it's a simple factual question it's not about good or bad or good or evil or right or wrong. It's simply judgment, legal judgment is a conclusion that can be reached rationally through the application of an intellectual process. In this sense, judgments are neutral. We should all be able to agree ideally on what a judge decides because we just refer back to the law system, to the norms. That's all. Whether it's good or bad, is a different topic it's not a top it's a topic for ethicists not for lawyers so what this also means is is that law is a social order it's an order because it structures human behavior but it's social because it's it's completely socially constructed in this sense think about it if we don't have values referencing outside of the legal system it means it's a social order. Humans made all of this. Morals, religions, these also qualify as social orders. We can distinguish this from natural orders, such as the example that Kelsen uses is logic. Logic has norms. There are certain things that are logical and true and logically false. This does not originate or emerge strictly from the human mind. This is found outside in nature, out, out, outside of the social, unlike the law of morals, completely social. So this brings us to sanctions. A norm has to be sanctioned. So he distinguishes here between two kinds of sanctions. He talks about transcendental sanctions. This is again outside of society. A transcendental sanction means the justification for the punishment comes from morals or from religion or some idea of nature or our terrible pop cultural understanding of karma. On the other hand, we have socially imminent sanctions. These originate completely within 
human society. So legal sanctions, it's not when you go to prison, it's not God punishing you. It's not nature punishing you. It's society punishing you. So the legal system has no values outside of its own compliance or not. And its sanctions find their justification from within the legal system. Nowhere else. In this sense, moral sanctions are also socially imminent, according to Kelsen, because moral disapproval is a social construct. It's not natural. So at this point, this is where I want to diverge a bit from the typical reading of Kelsen. Because, you know, Kelsen's name is very often equated totally with his idea of the Grundnorm, the basic norm, from which all norms, as they refer infinitely back to each other, that chain is broken by introducing the Grundnorm, the basic norm that justifies everything that follows from that. You know, this is a typical kind of solution to a problem. If we have a paradox, where does this law get its justification? From that law, from that law, from that law. And eventually you have this paradox where you can infinitely regress. And one way to break a paradox like that is to appeal to a value higher than hierarchically higher than the level on which you're operating at that moment. And Kelsen does that by referring to the Gund norm, which is the norm that kind of breaks open this infinite loop and puts a, you know, the buck stops there. And this is what he's been famous for, but I don't think this is the key here for me in this chapter. What I think is more interesting, and which I think is, he spends way more time talking about, at least in chapter one, is the coercive nature of legal sanction. So as we know, sanctions can exist in society in a moral sense, taboos or being shunned from society, polite society, breaking of etiquette. You don't get invited to parties, perhaps. This also happens when you study legal positivism. But for Kelsen, coercion does not exist in those kind of sanctions. It is only in the law that we find real coercive sanctioning, violence. So how did this arise? He starts from a very Hobbesian starting point, saying that violence was widespread and anyone could enact violence on others and that this was a threat to social security. So in order to increase security, mutual security within a society, violence had to be taken out of the hands of most people and centralized and monopolized in one place. And in this way, the average man becomes less and less violent for his own security. Until all this violence is monopolized in one organ, namely the state. Some forms of personal violence have remained, such as, well, blood feuds are gone, but took much longer than other forms. Self-defense is still allowed in many cases. So not all violence has been monopolized, but of the vast majority of it. At this point, Kelsen brings up St. Augustine, who asks the question, what's the difference between the threats and violence of a robber gang compared to the threats and violence of a state. But no, seriously, what's the difference? And Augustine's answer to this was that the state has justice on its side. The robber gang doesn't. For Kelsen, as you might intuit, this is not a satisfactory answer. Firstly, justice is a transcendental value. Kelsen is not sure what justice is. So he says that cannot be the difference. So what is the difference between the state and a, and a gang? He gives a few answers to this, none of which 
satisfy me entirely. He says in the first case that when a robber gang threatens you to do something, they threaten you with violence, give your money or else. That or else is a command saying that violence will be inflicted. Whereas in the legal system, the sanctioning norm is an ought to. It's not a promise of direct violence. This is not entirely satisfying to me. Secondly, he says that the legal system's Sanction is backed by a Grundnorm, the robber gang's not. Again, uh, it's a kind of a circular argument to me. But he would say, the point is that the legal system or the state has a Grundnorm behind it. Finally, and this, this one I buy the most, but also not completely, he says that the advantage that the legal system has in its sanctions, its coercion, is this idea of objectivity over subjectivity. In other words, that legal sanctions and coercion is applied and decided upon by a judge who's impartial and objective to your certain case. He doesn't stand anything to gain directly, I guess. And the point is that he judges, as we said, through a rational process of applying existing norms he doesn't have skin in the game he's just going by this positive negative value inherent in the legal system on the other hand Carlson goes on to say that the a robber gang which can be stable enough can control the territory long enough can protect itself from external threats and that it's internal threats and, and, and norms are being basically effectively followed by the people living there, that such a gang could graduate to the point of a state. Although he never actually says that directly. He uses the example of pirate states in the past to say that they were state-like, but not completely states. Um, which, I mean, this again begs the question, <laughs> at what point? Uh, does a robber gang become a state for Kelson? I'm not sure. Maybe we'll see it in later chapters, although I doubt it. So, finally, I think the point that I'm trying to emphasize here is that rather than the Grundnorm, it, the aspect of coercion seems much more important in this first chapter for Kelson. He also gives his reasons for this. He says in the first place that it's coercive sanctions that distinguishes the legal order from other orders, from moral orders, religious orders, whatever. So coercion is a defining feature of the law. The second point is, is that it's through this coercion, this monopoly on violence, that we can make a direct and strong link between the law and the state. In Carlson's definition of the law, the state is essential and coercion, violence, is essential. Anyway, that's it for chapter one. I'm looking forward to doing chapter two next. Just to finish off with, here is a list of a lot of the kind of binary distinctions that Kelson draws in this chapter. Maybe it's a nice guide if you're reading it by yourself to keep that next to you and refer back and forth between that to see exactly kind of the these branching distinctions that he keeps making in this chapter, laying out the definitions and the work and the assumptions that we're going to deal with in the future. So thank you very much and have a lovely day and I'll see you next week. Thank you.